The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, you may not be in prison, but there is no one in the United States over the age of 18 who cannot be indicted for some federal crime. We have laws for everything. This is literally a crime to misuse the Smokey the Bear logo. And you're guilty of something. 400 to 500,000 regulations that carry criminal penalties. How we've become a nation of criminals. Plus, the man behind the Minneapolis miracle is taking his talents to the Mile High City. God has me right where he wants me. Why Broncos quarterback Case Keenum says he's playing for more on today's 700 Club. I'm going to give him the glory for it. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. It looked like the Senate confirmation hearing room was turned into a zoo yesterday. Uh, fingers pointing at the Senate's top Democrat reportedly organizing some of that chaos. Protests, heckling, and constant interruption, 44 interruptions during the first hour, attempts to delay the proceedings of this very important uh, nomination. It was quite a show, Pat. Despite the chaos, Judge Kavanaugh finally had the chance to speak for himself. CBN Capitol Hill's correspondent Abigail Robertson takes us inside the hearings. Those expecting a showdown throughout Judge Kavanaugh's nomination were not disappointed Tuesday with a steady stream of protesters interrupting often contentious opening statements from both sides of the aisle. Mr. Chairman, I think we ought to have this, this loudmouth removed. The long-awaited hearing kicked off with about 90 minutes of Democrats complaining about the availability of documents from Kavanaugh's time working for the administration of George W. Bush. What are we trying to hide? Why are we rushing? Democrats called for a delay until thousands of those pages are available for them to fully review. The fact that we cannot take a few days or weeks to have a complete review of Judge Kavanaugh's record is unfair to the American people. Republican Senator Ben Sass told CBN News there is a record amount of information already available on Judge Kavanaugh. Judge Kavanaugh, more papers submitted to our Judiciary Committee than the last five judicial nominees to the Supreme Court combined. Dozens were arrested, and during one outburst, Senator John Cornyn called for members to take a deep breath and treat the process with respect. I am disappointed that despite his exemplary qualifications and outstanding records, so many of our colleagues across the aisle have announced their opposition even before he was nominated. Case in point, Democrat Kamala Harris, who came down hard on Kavanaugh, saying she's deeply concerned that he's too guided by partisanship. This nominee has devoted his entire career to a conservative Republican agenda. Judge Kavanaugh finally got his chance late in the afternoon, making his case as a neutral, impartial judge. I do not decide cases based on personal or policy preferences. I am not a pro-plaintiff or pro-defendant judge. I'm not a pro-prosecution or pro-defense judge. I am a pro-law judge. And in a positive development for the razor-thin majority, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey announced former Senator John Kyle will fill the late Senator John McCain seat. They plan to swear him in Wednesday. Judge Kavanaugh will be in the hot seat the rest of the week, fielding questions from both sides on topics like abortion, executive privilege, and gun control. Republicans remain hopeful they'll have him confirmed before the Supreme Court convenes October 1st. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. You know, it's really disgraceful, but uh, that's the way the game's being played. The Wall Street Journal was suggesting maybe that if the uh, Democrats walked out of the committee, the committee wouldn't have the appropriate quorum. I, I don't know if that's the case, and I, I don't know if that would shut them down. But uh, it's a pre-planned thing. Uh, the idea that they have to get the uh, secret documents uh, that were made when Kavanaugh was uh, sh uh, short-time counsel for President George Bush is just absurd. I mean, he has written hundreds of very important decisions. They're all on public record. The Democrats have all the information they need. 
And this is just a, uh, and it's an outrage. Well, uh, CBN Chief uh, Political Analyst David Brody is joining us now. David, uh, have you found evidence that somebody actually planned this demonstration? Did he come from the top? Well, here's the evidence. Uh, Dick Durbin actually saying it uh, in, when asked in the Judiciary Committee hearing, he actually said, yeah, we had a phone call, Chuck Schumer on the phone uh, call, uh, along with Dick Durbin, the two top Democrats in the Senate, and a lot of these advocacy groups on the left. So this was coordinated. It was funny, Pat, when I was watching this hearing, which, by the way, kind of felt like a, a Jerry Springer show run amok without the flying chairs. There were no flying chairs. But beyond that, it felt like a Jerry Springer show. Uh, but, but I have to tell you that that the, the protests were coming like once every, eventually once every 10 12 minutes eventually uh, uh, through the hour and a half or so in that first hour and a half so this was coordinated not even a question i mean there were some folks dressed up uh, in this uh, netflix show the or it's not netflix it's uh, some sort of show the handmaid's tale you know we're talking about uh, anyhow the point is is that it was out of control uh, and this is all democrats can do at this point because they can't stop Kavanaugh. they don't have the votes well, what's the deal? I mean, what does this show to the American people? Do, do these people who are running for president actually think it's going to enhance their chances? Yeah, they, they do. Uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Cory Booker, uh, both expected to run for president. Cory Booker saying the word traversed. I traversed the country. It was like it was, it was his uh, nomination speech at the convention. I mean, that's what it sounded like in the Judiciary Committee hearing. As a matter of fact, he actually sent out a fundraising email while the confirmation hearing was going on, which Ben Sass, uh, senator on the Republican side, took him to uh, task for that and said, how dare you? You don't go fundraising during a committee hearing. So this was all coordinated. There, there's been talk, by the way, Pat, I want to clear up something about the Senate rule that Democrats could have uh, walked out or yeah. at least at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a Senate Rule 26 that basically says if the majority leader and the, and the minority leader don't come to an agreement, then there should be no committee me meetings after 2 p.m. Technically, that's true. Technically, the Democrats could have said there is no agreement. We're going we're gonna to be done. A Senate Judiciary Committee spokesman told me just this morning that if they had done that, Grassley would have just continued on on uh, Thursday, uh, in, or excuse me, Wednesday, with the hearing, and there would have been no opening statements at all for Democrats. So Democrats had to choose. They could have stopped the hearing, but they wouldn't have had any other opening statements. So clearly, soliloquies were more important uh, than anything else. So the truth is they can't really block the uh, confirmation of this splendid man and uh, it's just strictly for show. But I, again, are they? Is there is their base happy with these uh, shenanigans? Well, the, the base is happy, but that's an asterisk uh, happy. In other words, uh, they're glad that the Democrats did something, but. Quite frankly, there's a liberal wing, as you know, of the Democrat Party that wanted these Democrats to walk out. But a Senate Judiciary Committee spokesman also told me today that, indeed, if Democrats decide to walk out and play all their shenanigans and stop the hearings, it doesn't matter because, technically, there doesn't need to be a hearing, and Grassley could just take the whole thing right to the Senate floor, and that would be that. Well, they, they've got to have a—is the rule they have to have a vote of the, of the Judiciary Committee before they take it to the floor of the Senate? Is, is, is that no. what— Yeah. Te te technically, no. Uh, what no. I've been told by the Senate, no. What I've been told by the Senate Judiciary Committee is that technically, and once again, we're into arcane Senate rules, but technically, they can take this thing right to the floor if they need to, Pat. Uh, the governor of Arizona has uh, appointed a uh, um, guy who I've known. He's a splendid senator, John Kyle, mm -hmm. uh, to fill out the, uh, the term of the late Senator John McCain. Uh, he will be a reliable vote uh, for the uh, Kavanaugh, won't he? He will. And we knew John McCain would vote for Kavanaugh, and obviously Kyle's going to vote for Kavanaugh. But here's the difference going forward. Uh, John Kyle has about a 96 percent conservative rating from the American Conservative Union. John McCain had about an 82 percent. So you're getting a more conservative Arizona senator. That'll bode well for the Trump administration. Obviously, that'll bode well for conservatives overall. So, so there's that uh, at play, too. But I, I, let me just say one last thing about the Kavanaugh hearings, because it really has become a Kavanaugh yeah. hearing. Uh, for the Democrats. I mean, and we're, once again, they don't have the votes. Just, just to be clear, what everybody needs to watch now is, is there a smoking gun, which doesn't appear there is any smoking gun out there, and whether or not uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, the two pro 
uh, choice, senators uh, will go ahead and somehow decide to uh, go with the Democrats. There's no indication that's going to happen at all. So at this point, and, he, and quite frankly, uh, Pat, even if they did side with the Democrats, and no one's expecting that, uh, you've got the red state Democrats. In other words, the Joe Manchin in West Virginia and Joe Donnelly in Indiana and Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota, all Democrats that are in uh, red states that Trump won, I have to tell you, uh, they've got some pressure on them because it's all about self-preservation for them. If they vote for Kavanaugh, they'll have a better chance at re-election. They vote against Kavanaugh, and all bets are off. Um, it looks, uh, what do you figure? They're talking October the 1st that they've got to get this thing done. Do you think there's any question? There's no question that the Senate won't vote for him, is there? No, I, this is going to go on as scheduled. Once again, Senate Judiciary uh, Committee sources telling me that uh, uh, Grassley is going to keep it moving uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even if it has to go into the weekend, but they're going to get this thing done. And look, it's funny, uh, the Democrats want all these documents. They already have a half a million documents, but they want, I don't know, 100,000 more. Uh, and it's really interesting because they already pretty much are saying they're going to vote no on Kavanaugh. So why do they want 100,000 more documents? To really vote no? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me, Pat. David, thank you very much for that insight. And uh, it's interesting. Wendy. Boy, it was tough to watch yesterday, though. Oh, just it was horrible. The animosity horrible. and the, the visceral. You, you know, the Supreme Court is supposed to be an august body. And with learned jurists, it's supposed to be an impartial forum. And now they have politicized it They're like uh, it's just disgusting. And Kavanaugh says, I'm not political. I'm not conservative or liberal. I'm, I'm going to interpret the Constitution yeah. as it's written, which is what we're looking for. Amen. All right. Well, coming up, in the U.S., there's a good chance you'll commit a crime without even knowing it. It's probably more like 400 or 500,000 regulations that carry criminal penalties. This is literally a crime to misuse the Smokey the Bear logo or the Woodsy the Owl logo. It's a crime to write a check for under a dollar. More on the countless federal regulations that Americans break every single day after this. Ladies and gentlemen, this next uh, feature is going to shock you. You see, the Democrats and the liberals are this way. If you don't agree with me, we're going to put you in jail. If you don't do exactly what we tell you to do, we're going to lock you up. Now, this is the kind of government they want. And those who are conservative want freedom. They want freedom from un uh, rules and especially unelected officials. But unelected government bureaucrats are crafting rules, hundreds of thousands of them, that have the power of law, and they're putting unsuspected citizens behind bars. That's the shock. And every one of us has found that if, if you think back about everything you've done, I think breathing and you're breaking some law. Jennifer Wishon brings us the rules are often so outlandish that millions of people in America, without even knowing it, are committing a crime every single day. Watch this. If you get out of bed today, there's a good chance you will commit a crime. There is no one in the United States over the age of 18 who cannot be indicted for some federal crime. That is not an exaggeration, says John Baker, a retired law professor from LSU. Here at the Library of Congress, this is the Federal Criminal Code. Its pages hold some 5,000 criminal laws passed by Congress and signed by presidents. That's a lot, but it's only a drop in the bucket when you consider there are hundreds of thousands of federal regulations that carry criminal penalties. I've seen the estimate of at least 300,000, it's probably more like 400 or 500,000 regulations that carry criminal penalties. For instance, it's literally a crime to misuse the Smokey the Bear logo or the Woodsy the Owl logo. It's a crime to write a check for under a dollar. It's a crime to label malt liquor pre-war strength. Federal agencies are often given tremendous power by Congress to create regulations that carry criminal penalties and can drastically affect people's lives. 
power that's been upheld by the Supreme Court. Unelected bureaucrats are making regulations that can land you in jail. Sure, and it's a huge number. We all have one thing in common, me included, which is at one time or another, we have probably violated some criminal regulation. We just don't know it. We were lucky enough not to get caught and prosecuted. So how does this happen? Political gridlock and lack of political will in Washington is actually empowering bureaucrats. In order for members of Congress to get legislation passed to reach compromises while avoiding political pitfalls, they're often vague, leaving the details up to the agencies in charge of the subject matter. There are so many of these regulations, no one knows how many there are, where they are, uh, and of course these can include traps for the unwary, people who are going about their business, uh, engaging in conduct that they would have had no idea violated any law, much less a criminal law, uh, and they can get tripped up and possibly prosecuted for violating those laws. And when the government has a hammer, Malcolm says, it tends to use it. This Twitter account tweets a federal crime each day. The project started in 2014 and will not be completed until the year 2848. That's a span of more than 800 years. And it's not just the federal government, state agencies write criminal regulations too. Feeding the homeless is a crime in many places where people are doing it for a ministry. John Whitehead, author of Battlefield America, has spent decades representing people in trouble with the law for simply exercising their constitutional rights. We had a case uh, in Arizona where a pastor wanted to have a Bible study in his home. Uh, the regulation, I, as I remember, was like for 10 people. He had 12 or 13. Some neighbors called. Seven policemen entered his home. He was finally arrested. He ended up serving 60 days in jail. This is for a Bible study. And uh, he was put on house arrest after that with an ankle, electronic ankle bracelet. Critics of federal agencies crafting criminal penalties say most of the time these violations could simply be handled with a fine. They're also skeptical many of the crimes aren't actions most people consider morally wrong. Instead, they're crimes because the government says they are, which is why so many people unwittingly break them. If we end up criminalizing conduct that no, you know, your average person would never have recognized was wrong, then people will all of a sudden lose respect for the rule of law. By the way, did you know it's illegal to walk your dog on federal land on a leash that exceeds six feet? How's the Constitution start? We the people. Whoa, think about that for a second. We the people, that means we're the government. The reason this is happening is because we're not taking action. You say the change is going to have to trickle up from local governments. I'm telling people, get down to that local city council. Get these things changed. I mean, arresting a pastor 60 days in jail for having a Bible study with a few extra people in his home? Is that a danger to society? Well, I don't think so. It's all a contributing factor to the United States having the largest prison rate in the world. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. We're going to talk to Professor James Duane about some of these things, but ladies and gentlemen, this is horrible, and uh, it's got to be stopped. Now, you know, the president uh, could stop all this. You know, he, 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 the acts of Congress, that's one thing. A few thousand laws passed by Congress, signed by the president into law. These other are unelected, and <clears throat> the president, by a stroke of the pen, could exonerate everybody from them and also cancel them. I, I don't think that the action of these federal agencies uh, could withstand a presidential veto. They could all be eliminated. And I think it's time the president, he could step up and do it. Think what it would mean. I mean, how much do these things cost? How much money are we wasting by putting people in jail, innocent people like that, that pastor Two more people, two extra people in a Bible study, and he's suddenly labeled a criminal. What was wrong with the judge in that town to, to okay that? Well, he that, should have had more sense. Well, he should have had more sense, but he, nevertheless, he maybe is under the uh, right. uh, law that he's got to uh, mm -hmm. abide by what's written. And, you, you know, we've got these three strikes and you're out kind of thing. All this business is getting tough on crime, but it's not just tough on crime. These bureaucrats want to force people to do what they want you to do. 
And if you don't do it, I mean, Smokey the Bear, for heaven's sakes, or writing a check under a dollar. I didn't know that was a law. And you know people have done that. Well, I mean, there's <laughs> stocks on the market that sell for less than a dollar. And if you want to buy one of them, you're going to have to write a check for less than a dollar. <laughs> I mean, the whole stock market, uh, you know, they've got all these penny stocks, lots and lots of them, and lots and lots of penny stocks. All that illegal. Ladies and gentlemen, it is appalling, and it's time the American people rise up and notify the president, for example. And I, I, I don't know the cost, but it must be absolutely astronomical how many people we're putting in jail and what it costs in, in human uh, capital, what it costs to put these people I incarcerated. And those jails become schools for crime, and they come out of there not better people. They come out of there marred for life because some crazy bureaucrat decides he doesn't like their conduct. It's, it's outrageous, and it's time we do something about it. Wendy, I'm worked up on this. Yes, amen. We better change the subject. But up <laughs> next, the quarterback that John Elway named as the starting quarterback for the Denver Broncos. Kid, I, I was John Elway for Halloween, three Halloweens in a row. Um, and uh, I had my little seven jersey, and I, I rocked it. Case Keenum talks about the three best moments of his life right after this. Um, miraculous blessings coming up September the 17th. You can get it then, but this is something you really want to have. You really don't want to know how you're going to get blessings. And uh, when I, I was reading about David, he said, you've blessed me, Lord. Sovereign Lord, I, you've blessed me, and with your blessings, I will be blessed. And God said, I'm going to bless you and your, your children beyond you. And David was thinking about the miraculous blessing of God. When God speaks a blessing, no, nothing in heaven and earth can stop it. How do you get those blessings? Well, we'll tell you September the 17th. It's going to be part of what we're going to be doing. Fun. Reminds me of that saying, one day of favor is worth a lifetime of labor. I like that. That's great. I like it's not mine, but I like that saying. I don't know where you got that. <laughs> All right, Case Keenum, he is the former Viking quarterback who threw what's known as the Minnesota Miracle to beat the Saints in the 2017 playoffs. But that incredible feat is only the third best moment of his life so far. So what are the first and the second? Take a look. Case on a deep drop, steps up in the pocket. You know, sometimes the ball just comes out of your hand just perfectly. And uh, this one came out really, 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 really well. Are you kidding me? It's a Minneapolis miracle! NFL quarterback Case Keenum remembers the joy of the Minneapolis miracle. A last second touchdown to beat the New Orleans Saints in the 2017 playoffs. It was so much fun, so cool. And I remember getting grabbed by um, the sideline reporter. Chris Myers, he asked me, this has got to be the best moment of your life, right? But I said, no, this is, this is not the best moment of my life. This is, this is third. This is probably going to go down as the third best moment of my life. The first being when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. The second, when I married my wife. And this, this will be third. Case experienced the highest of highs as a professional athlete, yet manages to keep every highlight in perspective. Those things that we have in this world that are of the world, and they don't last. Um, you know, they're over. And if you count on those things um, to be everything for you, they're just going to let you down. Um, just like we had an incredible moment one week, and it let us down the next week. Um, but if you hold on to your relationship with Christ and your relationship with your with your family and those people that you know that will be with you, that care about you. And that's what's most important. Case's love for football started with his father, a former coach who modeled unconditional love, win or lose. You know, he started, he started texting me, pray hard, play hard, take care of the football, and have fun. That's what I prayed before every game. No matter what happens, I'm going to play as hard as I can, and I'm going to give the glory to God. That uh, no matter what, God, I want my light to shine for you. His NFL career faced early disappointments as Case went undrafted after a record-breaking college career. Many people said he didn't have what it takes to make it in the NFL. Yeah, I heard all those things. Um, you're not tall enough, strong enough, you know, your arms, you know, you can't, you can't throw it far enough, you can't, you know, you don't have a strong enough arm. 
but uh, you know, for me, it was it was a lesson, and you gotta listen to the people in your life that uh, you know that that, that really mean something. Uh, your family, your friends, your coaches that believe in you, but but most of all, you need to believe in your Savior, you know, in Jesus and his his uh, his identity for you. In his book, Playing for More, Case talks about the importance of trusting God with his life in the midst of the pressures of professional sports. He has carried me through, you know, those 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 tough times, and and has been there, um, you know, more than anybody else could possibly have even tried to be. This offseason, Case was traded to the Denver Broncos and named the starting quarterback. To have John Elway say that uh, and introduce me as the starting quarterback of the Denver Broncos is incredible. And to remember that, um, you know, as a kid, I, I was John Elway for Halloween, three Halloweens in a row. Um, and uh, I had my little seven jersey and I, I rocked it. I know that God has me right where he wants me and he's equipped me for the time that he has me here. Case looks to the future with high expectations knowing he's doing all he can to be successful and trusting God with the outcome. I hold myself to a very, very high standard um, that I want to give everything I've got, every single play that I play, every single time I, I work out, every, every day I come into you know, my office here, I'm giving it everything I've got. I'm, I'm, I'm holding up my end of the bargain as well as I can. And I know that God, you know, we know through his promises, through his word, that he's going to hold up his, his uh, you know, his, uh, his end of the bargain. So, um, you know, I can rest easy in, uh, in the results and know that um, I'm doing everything I can. I'm going to give him the glory for it. Amen. What a successful life. Such an inspiration. Case Keenum just released a new book yesterday. It's called Playing for More, Trust Beyond What You Can See, and it's available wherever books are sold. Still ahead, we've got your email. John says, I borrow money from private investors to flip houses. Should I tithe on the total amount that I borrow? Your questions, honest answers, coming up next. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Tropical Storm Gordon slammed into the Gulf overnight, just barely under hurricane strength, with maximum sustained winds of 70 miles an hour and heavy rains. It's now downgraded to a tropical depression as it moves northward. The National Hurricane Center said the storm would bring life-threatening conditions to parts of the region, including a three to five foot storm surge. Gordon turned deadly when a tree fell on a mobile home in Pensacola and killed a child. The National Hurricane Center forecast Gordon to quickly weaken as it moves inland across Mississippi, Louisiana, and into Arkansas through Thursday. Executives from major tech companies are set to go before the Senate Intelligence Committee today. Facebook and Twitter execs are likely to face questions about political content, antitrust concerns, and consumer privacy. Google's Larry Page is sending written testimony. Lawmakers from both sides want the tech giants to explain how their companies are protecting the 2018 midterm election process from interference from Russia. Conservatives contend Facebook often censors their messages. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. As you just heard, next week we invite you to join us as we kick off 40 Days of Prayer for America. We'll also be praying for you and your personal needs. CBN Partners, you can look for this envelope in the mail. Inside, you'll find a Pray for America bumper sticker. It looks just like this. Um, and this card that you can fill in your prayer requests and mail it back to us. Or you can just call us at 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. And we will send you this packet right away. So... I like the bumper sticker. I think I'm going to put this. Yeah, I have a red car, so don't feel bad. All right. <laughs> yeah. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there's just nothing that won't be done with prayer. God, God will answer prayer. And if his people who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, then he'll hear from heaven and he'll forgive their sins and heal their land. We've got a lot of problems in America. We really do. And the one answer, the one answer is the anointing of God. God can do it. So don't hesitate to pray. Now, there's a note of sadness for all of you eager bachelors in our audience. <laughs> this beautiful lady is no longer on the market. She had, 
has been taken, and she's wearing a gorgeous piece of jewelry on her <laughs> finger. If you give me a close-up, please, on that hand. <laughs> the, and, Wait, where's it? Boy, that thing is a sparkler. Could, may I tell you, uh, may I find out what that means? Well, this means that I am an engaged woman. You are an engaged <laughs> And you're no longer available, and all these guys are going to be sad across this nation who are hoping one day that they might win the fair lady. You're going to get married. That's what it wow. means. Wow, I've actually hadn't heard someone say it just like that. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank That's you beautiful. so much. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm very excited. Um, it was a really fun uh, yeah, I, I proposal. Hear, I was completely shocked. It I hear you were climbing the old rag mountain, mountain here in Virginia, yeah, which is a... We were just hiking. We, uh, it was a foggy, very humid. We were sweaty. It was, we got rained on. We got to the top of the mountain. We were eating our sandwich. And I was just thinking about, you know, we started to thunder. I was thinking about, let's get down the mountain. And he said, um, I think I'll lighten my backpack a little bit. And I'm not even thinking. That means yeah. really the last thing on my mind. And uh, I, look, uh, I look back, and he's holding it in his hand. <laughs> and he said, can you carry this down the mountain? And it was very romantic. As, uh, I tell you, that, that guy, that, that says a lot. I, I really <laughs> like that. I mean, sweaty hot on top of old rag mountain to, to propose. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, he said he knew this was my, one of my favorite places. Yeah. And of course it is. And well, so. you'll make a very beautiful bride. And I congratulate you. That's nice. Uh, we've so been praying Pat. a long time, Wendy. Uh, yes. I remember years ago, I said, Pat, pray for my left hand. He's like, what's wrong with your left hand? I said, Nothing, but it needs a <laughs> ring. <laughs> now you've got it. And now it's praise happened, so it's, praise the Lord. Well, congratulations, dear. Okay, let's take some questions. Yes, this one from John. He says, I borrow money from private investors to flip houses. Should I tithe on the total amount I borrow? I get extra funds to live on while, uh, while houses are being rehabbed, so I am taking some of my profit ahead of time. Should I tithe on the whole amount or at the end? Uh. I think it's it's your call. You know, it's uh, you give according to what's in your heart. But I, I honestly believe, if you want to get technical, it's the profit. It's certainly in the whole amount that you borrow in order to buy a house and then turn it. Uh, that I don't think that would be appropriate I, I th unless you want to do it. I mean, God will bless whatever's in your heart. But normally speaking, it, the tithe would be on the uh, profit, not on the whole amount. All right. Here's one from Gina. She says, Hi, Mr. Pat. I'm an eighth grader in high school. Recently, my favorite singer released a new song. I like the beat to it. However, I know the lyrics are sacrilegious. Her music really helped me through my parents' divorce, and I feel a special connection, but I do not want to go to hell for listening <laughs> to her music. I also respect her advocacy for charity, and I don't want her to want her to go to hell either. What should I do? Well, I, I think... Uh... You know, you're not under any obligation to listen to anybody's music. And uh, if they're singing sacrilegious lyrics, you, sh you don't need to listen to them. And uh, I, I just think, I, I don't understand why this singer is singing stuff, but some of the things that are out there are really terrible. And uh, you don't want to listen to them. And so uh, you're not going to hell because you listen to somebody's music. Uh, you really aren't. Uh, but nevertheless, it will it will destroy your your faith, and uh, the stuff that has been out on rock music is just beyond measure. It's been horrible. I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but I don't care how uh, blessed you were by this particular artist's uh, music. Uh, I think that. It's time maybe to flip the dial and go to something else, all right? And there are so many great Christian artists out there with that there wonderful music that you can dance to. So a right. um, lot of choices. Okay, Reva writes, uh, I attend a church where many speak in tongues. I have prayed for God to bless me with this gift because I've been told this is God speaking directly to you. Why can't I receive this gift? Maybe I'm not spirit-filled like others. I want to be close to God. Does speaking in tongues mean God is speaking to you? I'm confused. Um, this is an expression of your spirit. Uh, your spirit is speaking to God, and your in, uh, understanding is uh, is not active. Uh, so it's a communication between you and the Lord. The Bible says they spoke as the Spirit gave, gave utterance. The Spirit gives the utterance, but you do the speaking. And um, 
very frankly, you can't speak in the vernacular and speak in another language at the same time. So if you continue to say, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, you are not going to be speaking in another language. You're going to be speaking in your vernacular. So you want to know the secret. It's just shut your mouth and let the Lord come and give you the word and then let the you speak as the Spirit gives utterance. You want to know what it is. That's what it is. All right. Amen. Jeremy says, what exactly is fasting? Well, fasting is doing without something for a period of time. Uh, you're withholding uh, one meal a day. You're withholding sweets. You're withholding, you know, what they said, you know, pleasant bread. Uh, you, you're withholding uh, several meals. You're, you're only existing on water. Uh, there are a lot of ways, but it, it means you're giving something up. And uh, whatever that is that you say unto the Lord, I'm giving this to you, Lord. And uh, David said, I afflicted my soul with fasting. And so that if you're denying yourself uh, food, for example, uh, you're, you're afflicting your, your, your body so that your spirit can be free. All right. All right. Janet says, can you, can you not believe in Jesus after you have accepted him into your heart? Is it possible to go back? Well, yeah. I mean, people, the term is backsliding. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my dean in seminary said, I belong to a denomination uh, who, belie uh, who believed in backsliding and practiced it. Oh, dear. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> you know, but yes, you, you can go back. That's the terrible thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's always the Bible to, has a thing, a fear to fall. You know, we're walking with the Lord, and there should always be in our heart a fear of God. You know, we, we walk with him, we love him with all our heart, but at the same time, there's a godly reverence, and we, we don't want to presume on God. I think the idea that Paul said that their, their condemnation is just those who think that they can get away with all kinds of things and still know the Lord. So the answer is keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eye on him every day. You're serving him. You're loving him and you're surrendering to him every day. All right. Amen. Thanks, Pat. Great Thank answers you. and some right. great questions. Well, let's move on to this story about Sue Quinder is a single mom who makes a meager living in India by sewing. But when her eyes began to develop cataracts, she couldn't see how to thread a needle. Without the help of people just like you, she would have lost her only means of supporting her family. Sue Quinder is a single mom. Since her husband left two years ago, life has been very difficult for her and her kids. We had to move back to my parents' house. They are poor too and barely have enough money to take care of themselves. After my father left, no one did anything for us. Our school fees were due, but we had no money to pay them, so we were forced to drop out. She earned a little bit of extra money knitting sweaters and other clothes she sells in the winter. When I was in India, it was over 110 degrees, and no one was buying sweaters. To make matters worse, she told me she had a hard time knitting because she was slowly going blind from cataracts. I could not see the thread. I knew something was wrong with my eyes. I went to the hospital, and they told me I needed an operation. I wanted the operation, but I could not afford it. A nearby hospital partners with CBN, that's where Sequinder went and got the surgery she needed free of charge. Soon, she was back home and able to see again. But we knew she still needed help earning money, so we surprised the family with a brand new sewing machine. Thank you. She can now work the whole year round. With a steady income, she can help her parents and provide for her children, who are now able to go to school again. I'm very thankful to you all for giving me this machine. I can see and I can work. May God bless you. Sue Quinder can now see and she can work. Thanks to you. If you're a CBM partner, you made that happen. 
and maybe you're not a partner, but you want to be, great. Go to your phones right now and just say, yes, I want to join uh, the 700 Club CBN. It's just 65 cents a day. $20 a month is all it takes. And when you do ask for Pledge Express, that means that your, deposit, your uh, gift will go automatically to CBN from your checking account. And when you do that, you save us some paperwork, and we want to send you this. This is Pat and Gordon's monthly teaching called Power for Life. These teachings will really encourage your walk of faith. This is yours when you join the 700 Club. Well, up next, a horse lover hurts her arm moving bales of hay. I couldn't lift it up like this, and I definitely couldn't put it behind me. There was a whole lot of pain. I knew I couldn't come out here and throw a saddle on a horse. Watch how she gets back in the saddle after this. Well, you're watching the 700 Club, and I'm so happy to have you all with us right now. I want to show you something that I think will warm your heart. There's a lady whose name is Roseanne Lobster, and she owns an Arabian horse farm and riding school. So when Roseanne injured what is known as the rotator cuff, she was at a loss of how to care for the horses she loves. Two weeks later, Roseanne was watching the story of a man on the 700 Club who had been supernaturally healed from a rotator cuff injury. That's when she said, yes, Lord, I want one for me. Take a look. Caring for her seven horses is a labor of love for Roseanne Loebser. In the fall of 2017, she was dragging 65-pound bales of hay into the barn getting ready for winter, when something happened to her shoulder. And a couple of them, I felt a twinge of pain because the bale was so heavy. That evening, though, I noticed when I went to pick up a pan to do something in the kitchen, there was a great deal of pain, and I had no strength in that, that shoulder. And then I couldn't lift it up like this, and I definitely couldn't put it behind me. There was a whole lot of pain. The next day I went to my chiropractor and he said it was partially out of joint and there was a great deal of inflammation and the rotator cuff was inflamed. And actually when I would move it, it would pop. Every time I tried to fasten my seat belt in the car, I was well aware that there's still a lot of pain in that shoulder. And so I basically had to just stop using it. I was crying out to the Lord for healing because it was quite painful. I knew I couldn't come out here and throw a saddle on a horse. <laughs> it just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Lifting something with this arm just wasn't happening. Roseanne began trusting God for healing. And that whole week I was, I was going over the healing scriptures in the Bible. I prayed for other people to be healed and they get healed, but it was my turn to receive. And so it was about a week later, I was watching the 700 Club and then Gordon had this word of knowledge about a shoulder. It was a testimony of another man's healing of a rotocuff shoulder injury. And I perked up immediately. And he was talking about how painful that gentleman's shoulder was and how long he'd been injured. There's someone you're asking, please say rotator cuff. You have a rotator cuff injury in your right shoulder. And I thought, well, if it's a word of God, it never falls to the ground. It's always active and energetic, and there's power in a word from the Lord. And so I did. I grabbed it. Praise God. I didn't want that pain any longer. After I grabbed that word of knowledge by faith and started praising God, and I actually could raise it up like this, and there was no pain. And within an, an hour, all the pain was gone. Roseanne has been pain-free ever since. I can throw a saddle on a horse. I can go riding again. Well, I just rejoice that God loves me so much. He wants me pain-free. <laughs> News. Here's another one. Her name is Paulette. She lives in Griffin, Georgia. She said she was diagnosed with cancer that has spread to her uterus, and she was having treatment at Emory University. And one day, she and her husband heard Wendy say, quote, there's somebody you've been diagnosed with cancer. You found it has spread to your lymph nodes. And God says, quote, do not fear. I'm going to stop that cancer in its tracks. Mm. 
Paulette and her husband said, that's for us. We take it by faith. Wow. She uh, called our prayer center last month, and she is now cancer free. Praise God. Isn't that, that is wonderful? awesome. Yeah. Wow. Patricia of Deltona, Florida, was diagnosed with lupus in 2015, but had been suffering from the symptoms since 2006. One day, she heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat, saying, uh, someone is being healed of lupus. Patricia felt an immediate response and believed God was speaking to her. After a few weeks, her symptoms cleared. Her doctor did the blood work and confirmed Patricia no longer has lupus. Praise God. Uh, do you all have any idea how the Word of God works? How did it come about? How did, it, did, did this world come into being? God said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, let the earth come forth, and he came forth. Let the animals be on the earth, and they, they were the so. He spoke, and it was done. That's how his word is communicated. He speaks the word. By your, you shall eat good by the fruit of your lips. You confess his goodness. Now, we're going to confess for you. We're going to pray for you right now. Please join with us. And I'm going to join with Wendy. The two of us are going to hold hands together. And we're going to agree with you. Please pray with us right now. There's nothing impossible. Amen. Father, I hold before you these people in our audience who are suffering. Lord, there's, there are many people. They don't have enough money. They, they've lost their jobs. They, they're crying out to you. They don't know what to do. There's some who, women who have been abandoned. They, you, you've got children and they've been abandoned, and they don't know what they're going to do. And they're crying out to you for the answer. Even as we're praying right now, their tears are coming down their cheeks. And you, Lord, have heard their prayers. And we speak the word now that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will come down, and the blessing of, the God, of God will surround these people. In the name of Jesus, Receive an anointing and a blessing from God. Receive an answer to your prayer. May his touch be upon you. And right now, a uterus is being healed by the power of God. You shall bear a child, and the child will grow up in the wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Yes. Wendy. Someone with um, symptoms of Lyme disease, God is touching you right now, and you are being restored completely in the name of Jesus. Somebody has a broken pelvis, and just reach down and touch that area, and that, that it's a fracture. God will, will, will heal that. In Jesus' name, you'll feel the power of God. Amen. Amen. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from the book of James. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Well, that's all the time we've got for Wendy and all of us. This is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.